No one listens to your shit. Merry Christmas! Ho, 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 ho. I have a woefully undersubscribed subreddit, so please do me a favor if you're a Redditor, head on over to r slash postmortem studios and talk about anything related to any of my shenanigans. Peace. Hello lovelies, might not be much for Christmas, but it's Christmas. And what better time to talk about a mytho-historical figure, well known throughout the world, than around Christmas. And no, I'm not talking about Jesus or Father Christmas. For one thing, Jesus isn't historical. I'm talking about King Arthur, because I'm going to review Pendragon for you today. Now. I'm a bit triggered by this because obviously King Arthur is a British mytho-historical figure and the main people associated with Pendragon, Greg Stafford, who passed away in, in 2018, and Robin Laws, one's American, one's Canadian. Neither of them are British, so it's as it's a clear-cut a case of cultural appropriation as I can think of. Now, the original Pendragon was released in 1985, which was quite brave. It was within 10 years of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. If he will give us food and shelter for the night, he can join us in our quest for the Holy Grail. Well, I'll ask him, but I don't think he'll be very keen. Uh, he's already got one, you see? What? Coming out, so I imagine that uh, a lot of the early Pendragon games contained a lot of people going knee and refusing to go to Camelot because it's a silly place. But nonetheless, it came out, and while you may not necessarily have heard of it, or played it, it does cast a long shadow over a lot of other cultural movements and styles of gaming within tabletop roleplaying. Now when you buy a Greg Stafford game, you pretty much know what you're getting, you know the kind of things that are his obsessions, um, a kind of post-psychedelic sort of way of looking at the world, a very sort of spiritual and magical way of looking at the world, and you can draw a line from him to Robin Laws, who is also associated with the game, and see him as a further sort of development along that sort of line of thinking. In a lot of ways, Stafford was like the, the Pat Mills of role-playing. Pat Mills, if you, if you don't know, is a famous... Uh, British comics writer, the driving force behind 2000 AD, but his particular obsessions you know, stand out in his work, and the same can be said, I think, of, of Greg Stafford. He was making story games before there were really story games. Prince Valiant was one of his. It's another one that not a lot of people have heard of or, or played, but which casts a long shadow over gaming. The Ghostbusters role-playing game, Ghostbusters International, it was powered by D6. That was one of his. Perfect entry-level RPG, very story-focused, with the system kind of fading into the background of being being cut down. RuneQuest, Glorantha, this whole sort of multicultural idiom that now runs rampant through all of role-playing, kind of has its start in RuneQuest when it was refreshing and different and new, and it was all about how different the different cultures within the fantasy world were. Now there's a kind of homogenous splodge <laughs> where that all was, unfortunately. But that idea kind of started with RuneQuest, with treating monsters as more than monsters. Hero Quest is, is uh, more mythological looser system approach to the same topics that you find in RuneQuest. Again, that kind of uh, post-psychedelic sort of look. He was very much influenced by Elric and all of that that kind of work, like, like many people were, I think, particularly within gaming. I mean, the idea of order and chaos rather than good and evil, all of that kind of thing really comes from Elric and, and associated works. So yeah, he was doing story gaming before story gaming was really a thing, but with a different slant than a lot of modern story games have. 
his work kind of straddles the gap in a way that my taste in games straddles the gap. I wouldn't say I'm a traditional gamer, I wouldn't say I'm a story gamer. I like a mix or, and I like to tailor the system to the particular story. While Stafford's work tends to stretch back and forth across that line at different points. So I feel a, a certain amount of kinship and sympathy with the game. Now I'm reviewing the 5th edition, there is a 6th edition on the way. How much different that is I don't know, I haven't been keeping up with it, but at the moment the 5th edition is the most modern, complete edition. So if we're talking about what is essentially a story game, you would expect to find quite a rules light system with a lot of narrative focus. That's, that's the way we think of story games today, but this just isn't the case um, with Pendragon at all. Um, I probably don't need to go too much into the system. It is a consequentially scaled back and narrowed version of basic role playing, which powers Call of Cthulhu, uh, RuneQuest, uh, Mongoose's Legend, a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, that's what it uses, which is normally a pretty gritty percentile based system that doesn't at first blush seem suited to a much more narratively focused mytho-historical sort of game. I mean, it's used to power Call of Cthulhu, but then you're basically up against implacable and undefeatable forces in Call of Cthulhu. In this, you are playing a knight, and only a knight, unless your games master is particularly forgiving. And that's why the rules are kind of narrowed. You can reduce all magic and fairy world and, and so on to basically hand-waving as much as you want. And it's only knights that really get any development or depth to them. So that's the kind of narrow focus that we do see in modern narrativist games, but it's not reflected in the system, but the way in which the systems are applied. That's where the narrative comes in. So it really it really does straddle that gap between the kind of emergent story play that we come to expect from old school role playing and the more narrativist form of role playing. But none of that's really reflected in the system. <laughs> the book is an excellent primer on the mytho historical setting, on the predominant myths around King Arthur and, and all the rest of all the rest of that. Rules, eh, you can apply any kind of rules you wanted, but it's a treasure trove of information on chivalry, medieval household management, arms and armour, important events in, in Britain, most particularly England at the time, um, and it marches you through essentially a couple of a couple of centuries of development if you take it to it to its fullest extent, with all the changes and so on that go on there. And the game is laser focused on this idea of playing knights and living the chivalric life and moving from earlier, more primitive forms of chivalry and knighthood through to what you're probably imagining, which is the, the mytho-historical Victorian spin on what <laughs> the myths were. So it, it takes you through all of that. It handles modern objections quite well, I think. It makes no bones about the fact that this is rooted in history and in historical mores and beliefs and all the rest of it, and that you only, you're only supposed to play a knight, though you can tinker around the edges if you want, and knights are all men. You know, it expressly says that and then says, if you want to make exceptions, you can. Here's a couple of tools uh, and methods for thinking about that which seems to me a better way of going about things, providing people options, rather than overriding history or overriding past canon, which is what we tend to see more in games, while, while people desperately clutch for good boy points and allow the integrity of the setting, the plausibility of the setting, if it's historical, the historicity of the setting, all to slide, which to my mind, has a negative impact on immersion within the game. Now, the rules are almost inconsequential. You could easily plug D&D or an OSR game or Dragon Warriors or Hero Quest would be a good fit in with its more story-based system. That would, that would plug in quite well to this. And then just use the structure of the game. And at each year 
of gameplay is split into four acts, spring, summer, autumn, winter. And a lot of that time is taken up with questing, household management, tournaments. It's very organized, very structured. And this might seem like a weird comparison, but that, that can work really well. It's one of the few things that makes comedy work in role-playing games, and that works for paranoia. You always know the steps you're going to go through before and after the adventure, the, the debriefing, the R&D equipment, all the rest of it. Similarly, with this very structured and staid society that you're inhabiting in this game, you know roughly what's going to happen in each of the four acts of each year. And it's really focused on family and dynasty. You're expected to play over generations for your character to marry, whether politically or for love, to have affairs, for things to be going on. And there's a lot of tables for random events and so on, all of which has fallen out of favor, but can be a real trigger for role playing, trying to incorporate these things and make them fit into your character, into your character's family structure and all the rest of it. There is traditional monster hunting, um, fighting off the Saxons, <laughs> all of that kind of thing. But there is also this real meaningful emphasis upon putting down roots, being good or despotic to your people, uh, gaining in, in glory and standing, you're becoming a, a mythic level knight, essentially. So it, it's a good and interesting game. And I think a lot of people, both on the more traditional old school side and on the narrative narrativist side of gaming could gain a great deal by looking at this and seeing how what is essentially a story game but using older mechanics and, and styles of play has been successful and influential over so many years and what really makes it work is is not the system the system the system's fine i can think of better fits but that's going to be a matter of personal taste but the structure of the play, the presentation of the game, and how that works as a conglomerate together. It's one of those few games where I feel that system doesn't necessarily matter so much. And it's the information around it, it's the contextualizing of the rules, it's the structure of the play that is far more important. Another slightly bizarre point of comparison might be Lamentations of the Flame Princess, which is basically just old school D&D, but it's the presentation and the contextualization that the book provides that makes the game what it is and makes it so effective and popular. So if you're looking to run a game of any kind within the Arthurian mythos, then you can't get a better primer for gamers, I, I don't think, than Pendragon. Uh, many of its supplements, particularly the, the household supplement, um, are worth getting as well. Just to have like a meta system to run this stuff in the background or to give you a grounding in the history and the, and the myth of, of Arthurian legend. A great fit for Dragon Warriors, as I said, or for Hero Quest, as it helps kind of damp down that Glorantham wildness and creates a more structured game um, where it's easier to cope with those kind of narrativist systems as well. Style, it's a, a rather old style production, 5th edition big blocks of texts, not a, not a great deal of art. It, it's it's workmanlike. The real style comes through in the, the writing about the history, the chivalry, the mythology, the way society and, and magic and, and so on works in that, which brings it back up. So I would only give it a sort of three for a basic workmanlike, um, slightly better than Palladium layout, but the the content, the stylistic content, brings it up to a four. In terms of substance, it's a little scant on some of the details. It could have gone into it a bit more, but yeah, it's a game, not a historical treatise. <laughs> so I would then give it a four out of five for substance, considering the size of the game, the familiarity of the system and everything else. So that's eight out of 10, four out of five. It's an important game in the history of role-playing. If you can get hold of a first edition copy, it might be worth having one in your gaming library just to sort of do a retrospective on how games have developed in previous years. But 5th edition or the, the coming 6th edition, those are, those are well worth a look as well. Inspirational. Zang. It's been called misogynistic, racist, 
hate group, reactionary. It's been blamed for Trump for keeping women out of games and technology. None of this is true. If you want the real story, then you need to buy Inside Gamergate. Merry Christmas! Ho, 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 ho.